I'm going to die. And we do a very good job of that at the University of Arizona, don't we? Who dies? Old people die? Weak people die? But young, virulent people don't die. Now, maybe in, at the age of 70, I might get cancer, and maybe at the age of 80, I might get paralyzed. But I'm a long way from 70. I'm a long way of, from 80. So eternal life? Oh, come on. Not that necessary right now. What is necessary is to figure out a way of justifying that I can do whatever I want to do ethically and morally. That's very pressing. Well, you don't necessarily have to have religion to have ethics and morals. Well, exactly. Moral relativism is constructing your own ethical moral system that con conforms to whatever you want to do. Where is justice? What is mercy? Where is the sacred and the holy? Choices. Where's the truth in all the voices? Give me an answer. Don't waste my time. Tell it to me straight. The truth is getting hard to find. I have objections to what I've learned. I have questions and concerns. Give me an answer. Yeah, what's the logical link between God simple. doesn't exist if and there is, there is no, no right mind wrong. prior to the human mind, then it's obviously the human mind that creates right and wrong. You're not going to have right and wrong without a mind. Inanimate matter does not define good and bad. You have to have a mind to define what is good and what is evil. No mind, no good and evil. So, if there's no mind prior to the human mind, then obviously it's the human mind that defines good and evil, which means this human mind defines it one way, that one another way, that one another way, this one another way, the Nazi another way, the white South African another way. Nobody's right, nobody's wrong. We're not pompous, arrogant people. We just realize everybody has their own take on it. It's all relative. But you're committing a fallacy of equivocation here. You're jumping from, like, you're jumping from a mind defines what is right and wrong to every individual mind defines what is right and wrong. I would say it's some fundamental, unique characteristic that's peculiar to all human minds that defines what's right and wrong. Obviously, rape can't be wrong if there are no humans around, because who would be doing the raping? Murder can't be wrong if there are no humans, because who would be doing the raping? I agree that morality has something to do with human minds, but that doesn't mean it's as simple as every individual mind gets to make up their own morality. Why? Then who does? Who creates a moral absolute? Well, who says that someone has to be doing it? All right. What creates a moral absolute? That's a good question. We have this thing called philosophy that decides these things. You're up a creek without a paddle if you're going to try and explain to me how you can have an objective moral without God. It, it's it's like impossible. You, it's like you, you might as well pretend. give up right now because you're not going to do it. It's like you want to pretend 2,000 years of philosophy aimed at answering this question just didn't happen. No. What you do is you look at the best philosophers and you see that they acknowledge. I haven't provided a basis for an objective moral. Be it Kant, he tried it. He couldn't pull it off. What about Thomas Aquinas? Thomas Aquinas' natural law for morality, or morality is specifically formulated so that it doesn't rely on God at all. Of course Thomas Aquinas relies on God. No, Come that's, on! That's widely Thomas considered... Aquinas was one of the most devoted followers of Jesus yes, Christ. You but can that's imagine. one of the great successes of Thomas Aquinas' morality is that he specifically formulated it to be consistent with atheism. Absolutely not. No way. Come on. Well, look at John. That's Stuart the first Mill. time I've ever heard that one. That's for sure. That's a good one, buddy. Come on, man. You ripped that one out of I don't know where. Thomas Aquinas was one of the most brilliant Christian thinkers of the past 2,000 years. Thomas Aquinas was not committed to showing that morality exists separate from God. Come on. What have you been reading? Well, you're not reading your Aquinas, I guess. How about John Stuart Mill? Yeah, what about John Stuart Mill? What did he show? He constructed a mode of morality known as utilitarianism, which does not depend in any way on God's existence. Yeah, and I can promise you, utilitarianism justifies Joseph Stalin 
just as clearly as it justifies Mother Teresa. And Joseph Stalin used Mill's utilitarianism to justify the slaughters and the gulags that he performed. Again, it's like you want to pretend that 200 years of utilitarian philosophy aimed at explaining away things like Joseph Stalin's gulags never happened. No, Stalin was totally consistent with utilitarianism. Stalin was committed to communism will bring so much good into people's lives. So much good that we need to slaughter a few million people. So we have to do that. But it'll help us realize great good for far more people. He was totally consistent with utilitarianism. But slaughtering all those millions of people did boost the economy of Mother Russia. Thank you. <laughs> Technically, a communism is the best type of society there is. Without communism, it, communism is perfect, just the human element just brings it down. There are many people today who consider themselves utilitarians who certainly do not approve of people like Stalin and Hitler and so on. That suggests to me that you're being slightly disingenuous in representing utilitarianism as though it's consistent with these things. Well, that's because I have a, I'm a lousy communicator. So let me put it real simple for you. All of my atheists are altruists, wonderful people, all right? All of my atheist friends do tremendous good deeds. So I apologize to you if I've ever communicated that atheists all support Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler. That's false. What I have said is, if there is no God, there is no mind prior to the human mind that defines a moral absolute, which means it's the human mind that defines what's morally right and what's morally wrong, which means morality is totally relative. And what I have insisted in is that all the great atheist thinkers have to acknowledge that although they put together Kant's categorical imperative, Stuart Mill's utilitarianism, on and on, Soren Kierkegaard and on and on, none of them have shown logically, reasonably, why there can, is a moral absolute if there is no God. How about this one? Abortion. Does the Bible state that abortion is wrong? The Bible never mentions the word abortion, but the Bible clearly says, do not murder. So obviously, if, if abortion is simply removing excess skin, there's nothing wrong with abortion. But if abortion is terminating a human life due to inconvenience, obviously that's murder, so then it would be wrong. So then obviously the difficult question is, when does human life begin? Most of the Gospels were actually written hundreds of years after Jesus died. Really? If I remember correctly, it was supposed to be possibly within 50 years, but... When do you find the Sir, in Jesus' lifetime? We find them sir, if, if the Gospels after. were written hundreds of years after Christ, then why did Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, quote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in letters he wrote in 115 AD? Why did that Clement, Bishop of Rome, write letters in 95 A.D. in which he quotes the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 95 A.D. is a long time after people died. And I'd have to, I'd have to see what all those uh, in detail, but I'm just quoting biblical scholars who are actually theists, so. Well, it used to be taught on every major university campus in the United States that the Gospels were not written until hundreds of years after the death of Christ. But there have been so many manuscript finds over the past 50 years that have completely smashed that school of thought. It's crystal clear the Gospels were written in the first century. Sir, we have a fragment of the Gospel of John, chapter 18, that's dated 130 AD. It's in the John Rylands Museum in Manchester, England. The Gospels were written in the first century, very, very clearly. That's still a hundred years after Jesus died, long after anyone who saw him would have died. Sir, those are copies. We don't have the originals. But you don't have any evidence for when the originals were there. I can promise you, sir, if the Gospels are quoted at the end of the first century, it means that your whole theory that they weren't written for hundreds of years is erroneous. Wouldn't you agree? No. no. Okay. I quoted John Stewart last night and that was only a couple days ago. What's your point? Well, think about it. You're saying that they can't quote something. 
You're saying that they were written in the first person and all you have is evidence a hundred years after they died. That you can't make that jump without any more evidence. I heard you say the Gospels were not written until hundreds of years after the fact. Did I, what, did I mishear you? No, you no. said that, right? Yeah. Okay, if people are quoting, quoting the Gospels in 95, 100, 105 AD, isn't it clear that the Gospels were written before 95? But you don't know how long before. You're no, you're right, I don't know exactly hand. how long. But isn't it crystal clear that if the Gospels are being quoted in 95 AD, that the Gospels were written before 95 AD? They could have been written in 94 AD. Yeah, right, 94, yeah. 94 and a half, December 94. That's still long after anyone who saw him would have been dead. Oh, all right. Okay, now, a, go a, a letter of Paul written 50 to 52 AD, 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. Verses 3 through 8 read as follows. What I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised from the dead on the third day according to the Scriptures, that he appeared to the apostles, to Peter, to James, to over 500, and last of all, he appeared to me. 50 to 52 A.D. 20 years after the historical fact. All of the basics, death, burial, resurrection, eyewitnesses who saw him, recorded right there. So there is not this great gap between the events of Christ's death on a cross and his resurrection and the writing. It's right there, boom, right after the fact. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 years after the fact. Okay, so let's let's just assume that, that it was written in the first hand. What necessarily makes that account any more accurate than any other religious account, which could completely, uh, you know, contradict what the Bible says? It doesn't. There's nothing about the Bible that makes it better than the Quran or the writings of Siddhartha Gautama Buddha or American history. So why should I follow Jesus Christ instead of Zoroaster? Because when you read the historical record of how Jesus lived, taught, died, and rose from the dead, the overwhelming historical evidence is the dude is credible, totally reliable. Who can you trust more than Jesus Christ? Well, that's circular logic. Circular. That's a, that's what the definition. What on earth is who, circular about who that? Who can you trust but Jesus Christ? Uh, you're assuming that Jesus Christ existed. He says, "I existed. I was the Son of God. Therefore, you can trust me, because I'm the Son of God. Because I told you." That is not what I said. Let me say it one more time. You said, "Who can you Read trust more than Jesus Gospels. Christ?" Read the Quran. The Quran is very historically reliable as well. Look at the life of Muhammad. Look at the life of Christ. Look at whatever other option you're seriously considering. Yourself, let's say. Look at the facts, historical facts, and ask yourself, does the evidence point to Christ being reliable, or does the evidence point to Muhammad being reliable, or does the evidence point to me being more reliable? Follow the evidence. I think the evidence for a historical Jesus as a figure is pretty strong, but the evidence for him being uh, a deity is a little more sketchy. And sure, a lot of you people... you die and rise from the dead, I'll listen very closely that, to everything you have to say. That account is, I mean, there's not a whole lot. Why didn't, why are there, besides a very, very uh, controversial snippet of Josephus's writing, why are there no third party writings? Why did no outside of Christianity, why did no one talk about this? Why is it not written down in any other history? Most historical figures, you can, you can verify history Anything that's written down isn't equally assumed to be true in history. They have to think, are there other accounts from different sources that verify this, you know? Good. How accurate are those sources? Good. So why are there no other outside sources that verify this? Then I'm confident that you as an honest intellect, who has just laid it out so clearly, I'm confident that due to the test you've just put forward, you know 
that there is absolutely nothing from ancient history about the Greeks, Romans, Spartans, Athenians that you can accept because you don't have records anywhere near to the close to the date of occurrence the way you have for the New Testament Gospels and you don't have this other contradictory evidence for it. Well, there's, so you've just done a great job wiping out all ancient history. There is a lot of history that has lots of evidence from other places. Like you can say that Jerusalem or some other city existed because it's referred to in multiple texts, including the Bible, you know. But I guess what I'm saying is an extraordinary uh, claim requires extraordinary evidence, you know. If yep. you're going to say that someone rose from the dead, I need something very, very reliable to... You bet. You want it on video, right? Yeah, like a historian could say, this guy lived, this guy died, and he didn't really do much. He was this guy. And that's not hard to believe. I can. It's not going to change my worldview if that's true or false. If something like what you're trying to say is true, that's a big deal, and I need some serious evidence to back that up. Okay, define serious evidence. Well, how about any uh, third-party sources? Why did, why did uh, around the time of Jesus, he's supposed to be going around rising from the dead, why don't you hear about that anywhere else but the Bible? Well, you do. Tacitus talks about a superstition. He, he refers to the resurrection probably as a superstition. Y yeah, that's not exactly supporting your case, though. And you've got the Jews writing about Jesus but as not, a worker of magic. And they called him a false magician. And obviously they the reason he they called him a magician dead? is because of his miracles. And he's saying, they're saying, yeah, and he performs these miracles, but he's dabbling in magic. And so they dismiss it as magic, but they're honest and talk, call, call it magic. And there, there are hundreds of other people that they talk about the same way in those texts. Yeah. But now don't flip off from what you were asking me. What you were asking me was, did some of his opponents write about him? And I, the answer is clearly yes. I was, I was clear earlier where I said, that a historical Jesus has evidence, but evidence for his godliness is significantly less. So these third-party sources aren't saying, yeah, he rose from the dead and all that kind of stuff. They're saying he was a person and he started a following, but they're not saying he was the son of God. So what I hear you saying is you want someone to say, I saw Jesus risen from the dead. He claimed to be God, but I do not believe in him. Is that what you're asking for? I'm asking for someone to say, I saw Jesus rise from the dead, who isn't contained in the Bible. Any outside source from a third party. <laughs> You've got the Jews writing about him as being a false prophet, a worker of magic. And that's completely contradicting your point. No, it is not. How so? See, if you were to apply the test that you're giving me right now to the Quran, Siddhartha Gautama Buddha. I'm not saying that the Quran or they Buddhism don't exist. Are I'm not saying that they do. Well, if you're telling me that you don't think Muhammad existed, I'm saying that or they that don't Siddhartha have... Gautama Buddha didn't exist, that's sad. I'm really saying sad. That... I'm not saying that they didn't exist as people. There's actually a lot of evidence for Buddha existing. There's a lot of evidence. Oh, really? For what Muhammad is it? Existing. That he was an actual man. Who what is it? No, no, no. He's... You, you would have made the statement. Now, give it to me. What's the evidence that Siddhartha Gautama Buddha existed? There's lots of people, just like Christ, lots of people who claim to have seen him. Really? It's not any stronger necessarily. Really? Where are these Christ. writings that you've read that lots of people saw Siddhartha Gautama Buddha? Well, his writings are written down. Where are all these eyewitnesses that you're talking about? Give I'm me not a... a Buddhist scholar. I didn't ask you to be a Buddhist scholar. You're out here challenging the veracity of the resurrection based on the fact that you can't accept one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different eyewitness accounts in the New Testament. And you're saying, I need someone who saw Christ risen from the dead, understood he claimed to be God, but rejected that, and then wrote about that in order for me to believe that he did that. Well, I'm not saying that anything about Buddhism or anything like that. I'm saying, well, you're telling me that there is ample evidence to believe in Christ I'm saying that that's not enough for me, and you're not giving me any evidence that's changing my mind. 
and what I'm showing you you're, is you're telling you me are putting forward an unrealistic demand of evidence. Well, there's tons of things that could prove it. I mean, how about why doesn't we, we talk about a miracle? One good miracle. Why doesn't God ever heal amputees? Never once. People always say, oh, it's a miracle healing. Why does he never heal anything that could not have healed itself on its own, however unlikely, or been a misdiagnosis? Why doesn't an arm sprout back from a devout prayer? So what I hear you saying is, Why does every unless God miracle, heals an amputee, I don't believe he exists. I, all I'm saying is that there, when you're talking about things that can be proven and cannot be proven, there's a test of falsifiability, and there's lots of things that can falsify religion, all right? Or can prove it. If I saw that happen, that would, that would settle it for me. There would be no doubt. Or are we just going with the, uh, the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy thing where they say, uh, <laughs> if I prove myself, that would deny faith, and without faith, I am nothing. Or, or, or can you actually prove God? No, you cannot prove that God exists. You cannot disprove that God exists. God so is not a question of proof. believe on faith. But, and, but that faith had better be based on evidence. You better not just blindly believe. It better be based on evidence. But you've got to be very careful when it comes to your demands that God do a certain thing in order for you to believe in Him. That's a very dangerous path to go down. That's just like the guy who says to the girl who says, I love you. Oh, yeah, prove it. Have sex with me. And if you don't have sex with me, I don't believe you that you love me. You are playing a manipulative game here that is dangerous as all get out. You don't, I hope you don't treat people that way, and you better not treat God that way. You better not say, okay, God, in order for me to believe that you exist, this is what you got to do. And if, by the way, if you don't do this, then I don't believe in you. That's a very intellectually dishonest path to go down. I hope you don't treat people that way. Woody Allen said, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Thanks, Woody, for your honesty. Woody also said, who cares about living on in my fans' minds? I'm interested in living on in my apartment. Thank you for your honesty, Woody. Woody Allen also said, who cares about achieving immortality through one's achievements? I'm interested in achieving immortality through not dying. Thanks for your honesty, Woody. I am sick and tired of books that communicate. Just accept death. It's a natural part of the evolutionary cycle. Death is an enemy, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus Christ didn't look at sick, dying people and say, don't worry about it. It's cool. No. Jesus healed sick people and he raised dead people. One day, Jesus was approaching the town of Nain, and a funeral procession was coming out of that town. It was an especially tragic funeral procession because beside the casket walked a woman who was a widow. She had already lost her husband, and the body in the casket was the body of her only son. He had died. She was a grieving woman. She knew the pain of death. She knew the pain of loneliness. She knew the pain of separation from her loved ones. She knew the pain of being separated from those who she depended upon so significantly in life for security, for companionship, for love. Jesus stopped that funeral procession and he performed a miracle. He said to the boy, get up and the boy came back to life, and Jesus gave that son back to his mother. What a tremendous reunion. What tremendous joy. What tremendous satisfaction for that woman to have her son, her only son, back alive. Jesus Christ put a soul and a body back together again. Obviously, if there is no God, there is no life after death. Obviously, if there is no supernatural God, when you die, you rot. When I die, I become fertilizer. But if there is a supernatural God, then it's possible that there's life after death. And Jesus insisted that there is a supernatural God and that he is that supernatural God, revealing himself in finite form, in a way that you and I, with our limited finite minds, can begin to understand and can actually be connected to. Are you connected to God? Are you connected to Jesus Christ? When you and I put our faith in Christ, he reconciles us to God. He reconciles us to himself. And he promises to unleash his power and give us eternal life, life after death. There are a lot of us who struggle with the existence of God.
But when you simply consider the laws of nature, that instead of prohibiting life, sustain life, it's incredible. Consider the planet Jupiter, a cosmic vacuum cleaner that protects this planet Earth from meteors and comets that come hurtling towards us. And instead of hitting planet Earth, the gravitational force around the planet Jupiter sucks them in to Jupiter, and they hit Jupiter or burn out in Jupiter's atmosphere, its gravitational field, instead of hitting the planet. Consider the fact that if the Earth was spinning a little more slowly or a little more quickly, the extreme change in temperatures would prohibit human life. It's amazing how human life is balanced on a razor's edge. It demands an intelligent mind. It demands a creator. But who is this creator? I'm not smart enough to figure out God. No offense to you, I doubt you are either. But the amazing claim of Jesus Christ is that he is God, the creator, revealing himself in a personal form, in a human form. And I have my best relationships with human beings. I am blown away by the fact that when God wanted to reveal himself, he didn't do it through a philosophical postulate or through a mathematical formula. Instead, he became a human being. I relate best to human beings. And Jesus revealed as God in human form that God is a suffering God who hurts when you and I hurt, who understands the sting of rejection, for Christ was rejected and nailed to a wooden crossbeam to die. He understands what it's like to be human, to be tempted. This is a God who you can connect with. This is a God who loves you. This is a God who is approachable. This is a God who you can pray to and who will hear your prayers and answer your prayers. Not necessarily the way you and I want them to be answered, but he's God. He's all wise. You and I are not. Jesus Christ said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you have a relationship with Christ? Do you have the gift of eternal life that Christ guarantees to all who trust in him? You can, when you very simply but very profoundly put your faith in him and begin to yield to him, begin to obey him because you trust him. God is waiting for you. Christ is waiting for you to make that decision. Don't put it off. Decide now. Trust in Christ. Open up your life. To him and he promises to forgive you he promises to put his Holy Spirit in your life and he promises to give you life with him now and for eternity I'm the pastor of Grace Community Church we meet every Sunday morning at 930 at Sachs Middle School in New Canaan Connecticut take the Merritt Parkway to exit 37 go to the end of the ramp take a left onto route 124 go approximately one mile and take a right into Sachs Middle School I'd love to invite you to join us this Sunday, 9.30, for our worship service. Thank you for your time. Have a great day. Give me an answer. Don't waste my time. Tell it to me straight. The truth is getting hard to find. I have objections to what I've learned.